Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can. In the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member FDIC. The T-Biz Podcast delivers T-News that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Think of us as a digital caravan of storytellers, bringing authentic, authoritative, and exclusive stories to you weekly from the tea lands. Hello, everyone. Here are this week's headlines. Advent International will bid $4 billion for Unilever's tea portfolio. India considers halting imports of Nepal tea. And sales of herbal supplements in the U.S. reached a record $10 billion in 2020. More in a minute, but first, this important message. What makes a perfect cup of Ceylon tea? The perfect cup is from the tea businesses that ensure the protection of all the children living within their tea estates. We salute Kailani Valley, Telawakili, Bogawanthalawa, Harana, and Eliptia Tea Estates. Support Save the Children, Sri Lanka. Advent International and the Singapore Government Investment Corporation, GIC, will bid $4 billion in a joint offer for Unilever's tea portfolio according to a report by Sky News. The Advent GIC Consortium is competing with at least six other large private equity firms that hope to acquire fabled tea brands such as Lipton Yellow Label, PG Tips, Lipton Ice Tea, Australia-based T2, Tazo, Puka Herbs, and several other regional brands. Unilever will retain its most profitable tea holdings in India and Indonesia, as well as the Lipton PepsiCo partnership in the U.S. Bloomberg estimates Unilever's entire tea business to be worth $5.7 billion. Other bidders expected to meet next week's deadline are the Dobby Investment Authority, KKR, and Clayton Dubier and Rice. Business Insight. In a July earnings call, Unilever CEO Alan Job said, quote, The balance of Unilever's tea brands and geographies and all of our tea estates have a very exciting future, but this potential can be best achieved, we believe, as a separate entity, end quote. The divestiture is expected to conclude by the end of the year. The Tarai Indian Planters Association, TIPA, and the Darjeeling Tea Association, DTA, are seeking a blanket ban on the import of Nepal tea. DTA Chairman B.K. Sarya complained to the West Bengal Chief Minister that a decline in production from 9.5 million kilos to 6 million kilos in 2020 and rising cost has affected both the domestic market and exports, Quote, the crisis has been further compounded by the sale of deceptive Nepal tea being sold in the Indian market as Darjeeling tea, he wrote. Immediate action is essential to save the industry's 87 registered gardens, he said. Nepal is a landlocked tea producer that relies on India's much more developed tea industry for re-export, shipping about 70 million kilos there in the past four years, according to the Tea Board of India. Tea Board data shows that only 27 million kilos has been re-exported during this time, making it likely that 43 million kilos were sold domestically, exempt from import duties and indirect competition with Darjeeling producers. Teas exported from India pay a 40% tariff to enter Nepal, 
But Nepal pays no tariffs to ship tea to India due to terms of the South Asian Free Trade Agreement. Quote, Nepal tea is sold at a much cheaper rate than the Darjeeling Kappa as its cost of production is very low, owing to rampant use of child labor and gross violation of labor laws, according to DTA. DTA advisor Sandeep Mukherjee told the Times of India that, quote, Unless import of Nepal tea into India is banned, the livelihood of those dependent on it would be at risk and may reach a point of no return, where more tea gardens in the hill would shut down, end quote. Biz Insight Indian efforts to limit Nepal tea imports have ebbed and flowed over the past decade. In May 2020, India halted tea shipments from Nepal for several weeks by imposing non-tariff barriers tied to sanitation and quality control. India growers complain that bulk tea shipments do not require a label of origin, FSSAI food safety compliance, or rigorous customs checks. Price induces tea brands such as Tata Consumer Products and bulk exporters to rely on Nepal to supply India's domestic blenders, but do not purchase direct. Sales of herbal supplements in the U.S. grew at 17% in 2020, exceeding $10 billion in sales for the first time. The total excludes brewed teas, but includes green tea powders marketed as supplements. The 2020 Herb Market Report, released annually by the American Botanical Council using transaction data from SPINS, reveals sales in the mass market channel grew by 25% to $2.1 billion in 2020. Direct sales, including online, grew 24%, about twice the rate reported in 2019. Sales in traditional natural and health food stores grew 1.6% to $2.95 billion. Elderberry, known for its immune-boosting properties, was the top seller along with apple cider vinegar and ashwagandha. Sales of elderberry grew by 150% to $275 million in mass market and $54 million in the natural food channel. CBD sales plummeted 37% to $57 million in the natural channel and declined 30% in mainstream outlets during the first year of the pandemic, the first decline in sales since 2017. Sales of dry and bottled green tea soared in mainstream outlets last year, but sales of green tea supplements declined 7.9% in 2020, falling to $31 million and 13th rank among the top-selling herbal supplements, according to Spence. Business Insight U.S. consumers spent more than ever on herbal dietary supplements for immune health and stress relief in 2020, according to the report. Quote, During a year in which much was out of control, many consumers seemed to take control of their own health and prioritize self-care with herbal and fungi-based dietary supplements. As the pandemic stretches into its 20th month, it remains to be seen whether these trends and record-breaking sales will continue in 2021. End quote. Download the full report free at t-biz.com. 2020 Verbal Market Report. Aravinda Anand Theraman in Bengaluru reports on India's tea auction prices. India Tea Price Report for the week ending 11 September 2021. During the week under review, there have been more circulars following the Commerce Ministry's announcement on amendments to the Tea Act of 1953. In the most recent circular, the board has said that no permission is required to plant tea anywhere in the country. Earlier, this was restricted, but now this move could encourage new tea regions to add tea cultivation, it could encourage more small growers to cultivate tea, and it could possibly increase the volume of production. It remains to be seen how it will have an impact on the tea industry. On the 17th of September, the Union Ministry has called for a meeting with Tea Producers and Manufacturers Association 
to understand the relevance of the Tea Act of 1953, and it seems to be part of the move to initiate reforms to the Act. Also this week, the Darjeeling Tea Association have returned to the state chief minister asking for a ban on import of Nepal tea into India. The association points to the financial crisis in Darjeeling's tea industry and say that the import of substandard Nepal tea is adding to their problems. In markets, sales 36 saw good demand for all tea types in Kolkata. Middle East and CIS countries were active among export buyers. Among domestic buyers, Hindustan Unilever was active. Prices were nearly the same as the previous week. Guwahati saw good demand with both Hindustan Unilever and Tata Consumer products active. Prices and sales volume did not change significantly from the previous week. In the south, Kunur saw good demand for teas. CTC Leaves sold 86% of the total offering, thanks to major blenders participating in the sale. Orthodox Leaf, on the other hand, saw exporters in play. Some whole leaf grades sold for about 2 to 4 rupees higher than the previous week. Coimbatore saw low demand for Orthodox Leaf, while Kochi had few takers for Orthodox Dust. In Kunur, 109 kilos of green tea on offer remained unsold. And now, a word from our sponsor. Q Trade Teas works with tea purveyors at every scale, from promising startups to the world's largest multinational beverage brands in the hot, iced, and bottled tea segments. With U.S. based formulation, blending, and packaging services, Q Trade can help you innovate, scale up, and grow your specialty tea brand. For more information, visit our website, qtradetees.com. This week, T-Biz travels to Switzerland to learn from ETH Zurich physicist Caroline Giacomin the physics of that colorful sheen that rises to the surface of black tea. Is tea scum just that, or a revealing indication of goodness in the cup? And then we travel to New Delhi, India, where the Rainforest Alliance's Madre Nanda reveals how practitioners of RA's sustainable farming methods are evolving towards broader, more holistic ecosystems in part two of our series on regenerative agriculture. Have you ever noticed a colorful sheen on the surface of your tea? It appears to break like ice flows in the Arctic as the tea cools. Researchers once thought tea film was due to waxy substances contained in the tea leaves and released during steeping. That's not the case. The delicate film is an interfacial interaction of air, tea polyphenols, and calcium carbonate ions in water. It does not form on white, yellow, green, or lightly processed oolong teas, only black tea. In many parts of the world, soft water prevents the film from forming. Is tea film a fleeting glimmer of color to enjoy, or an ugly scum to quickly dissipate with a squeeze of lemon. Caroline Giacomin, a physicist at ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, joins us to explain the physics of tea film from a study she and colleague Peter Fisher recently published in The Physics of Fluids. Thank you so very much for coming on the program. This topic is fascinating, and I see that it's already getting some attention. Let's first talk about what made you curious about that scum. I was working somewhere where the water was particularly hard. And one of my colleagues said uh, during our like afternoon tea time that he doesn't drink tea anymore because he doesn't like the stuff that is on top of it. He's from Taiwan and he had never seen that scum before or the, the film before. And I had never really thought much of it. Sometimes it was there, sometimes it hadn't been there. So I went home, I looked up how to get rid of the film for him. Uh, it turns out you can add lemon juice. That's what everyone on message boards and stuff will say. Not a particularly scientific answer, but, you know, obviously a traditional answer. My colleague drinks green tea, so lemon juice is not really something normally added to green tea. So that wasn't helpful to him. But I didn't really worry too much about that at the time. It wasn't really in my realm of research, but I came to start my PhD. And in our group here, we have a document my professor has made up of interesting ideas he's had over the years. And we study interfaces in this group. And on his list of interesting ideas was tea interfaces. And I said, hey, I think that's an interesting topic. And I've looked into it before. What a lovely story. And I applaud you for thinking broadly. You know, in science, 
It isn't just narrow routes. It's that wonderful opportunity to appreciate all the world around us. So how did you go about determining what the film was caused by? So there's a researcher from England in the nine, well, in the 80s and 90s. He wrote a 14-part series on tea. And about six or seven of those were about the tea film. So I kind of followed a little bit in his footsteps as to what he did. So he was studying the components of the tea film. And since we work with interfacial strength, I was going to be doing the strength of the film. We're studying types of tea, you know, lemon juice, adding sugar, adding milk, et cetera. But now we're studying the physics of it instead of the chemistry of it. So I based at least the choice of add-ins was kind of based off of his research. Rheology is the study of weird fluids. If you think about like black, which is the cornstarch and water mixture that kids like to play with, or the slime, or um, you think about measuring how shampoo or platin, uh, molten plastic flow. So that's kind of rheology. And then interfacial just means we're dealing with the rheology at the surface between two phases. In our case, we're dealing with the phase of liquid tea and air. And so interfacial rheology takes a metal device and we put it exactly in contact with the surface. And then we carefully control the movement of that metal device. There's a motor that's controlling the movement and also a sensor that is detecting exactly how much force the motor is having to apply to make the movement happen. And so that can tell us how brittle or how elastic the film is and exactly how much force we need to apply to break the film. So the thickness isn't the critical factor. It's the viscosity, the resistance to movement of the metal plate. How do you describe the film in terms of its physical characteristics as opposed to its chemical components? In our field, we use the phrase moduli, which can be the elastic and the loss or viscous moduli. So the elastic moduli determines the elasticity of it. How, you know, if you move the film a tiny bit, can it, can it reform itself back into its original position? So, you know, the, the, the loss modulus is kind of going to give you the brittleness of the film and the elastic modulus is kind of the, the flexibility or the stretchiness. So, from a practical point of view, you've described the physics. The chemistry was previously described as T-polyphenols bonding with calcium carbonate ions at the surface to create a colorful sheen. If I'm making a cup of tea, should I be anti-scum? Should I dissolve the scum to get rid of it? Or should I appreciate it for what it is and not worry? Is tea scum an indication that I need to do something with my water? Based on your research, what practical guidelines do you suggest on how to make better tea or to better enjoy tea? Tea, it depends on what you view as best for tea. Do you, it, the film, especially when you don't add milk, the film is quite beautiful. I'm a scientist describing tea scum as beautiful. But the, uh, when you add milk, the tea film is quite often not particularly visually pleasing, and it kind of looks gross. Those two films are actually made of very different components, which is why in my research, we weren't able to measure the resistance of the milk film because there's too much oil and fat in it for it to be measured by our device. It caused too much slipping, essentially. So those two films are different. So in if you're making tea where you would like to have milk in it, I would suggest you make that tea with water that's gone either through a filter or if you're living in a place where the water isn't particularly hard anyway, then it, it shouldn't really matter too much. You're not going to have much of a film anyway. Now that I know what, it's, what it is, I like to see it. If you really don't like the film, make you know black tea with lemon and you won't be able to see it then. There will still be technically a physically strengthened film there, but you won't be able to see it. So that's all that really matters at that point. It doesn't have much of an effect on the flavor. The Rainforest Alliance's Madri Nanda explains that while sustainable farming ensures that agricultural practices do not negatively impact and degrade the environmental, social, and economic aspects of the surrounding ecosystem, the focus shifts in regenerative agriculture towards adopting a broader, holistic approach that enhances biodiversity and improve soil health through increased microbial activities that build resilient systems capable 
of withstanding adverse climatic scenarios. Is there an accepted definition of regenerative agriculture? No, I wouldn't say there is a defined definition of regenerative agriculture. Say it's something new that was coined around 1980s by the Rodal Institute. Then, you know, we lost the definition. It has spiked again in 2015. In fact, in India, it is something which is uh, ingrained in our traditional practices. So it's, it's definitely not a new concept which is there. It draws from the principles of uh, agroecology and uh, holistic ecosystem management, looking both at the farm and landscape level. At at Rainforest Alliance, uh, we really believe this is a part of a broader framework of climate smart agriculture. It's an umbrella part. So uh, our Rainforest Alliance standard really looks at several other principles of which regenerative agriculture principles are one part of it. So it it includes, for example, in addition to uh, the sustainability dimensions, it looks at traceability, living conditions, child labor, forced labor, etc., And uh, an integrated systems management approach really aims to increase biodiversity. And you have to keep that in mind that improving anything that improves biodiversity then also helps us fight climate change, which is something which is a very intricate linkage and well-established. How do best practices in regenerative agriculture differ from sustainable farming? Sustainable farming definitely ensures that Agriculture practices are not negatively impacting and degrading the environment, social and economic aspects of the surrounding ecosystems. But I would say it is still maintaining the status quo. So wherever you are doing, you are not further depleting. When we talk of regenerative agriculture, then I would think it is more of a natural progression where you start regenerating your ecosystem, where you try and see how you can increase, for example, microbial activities and build resilient systems that can withstand the adverse climatic scenarios which we are facing uh, currently a lot of times. Regenerative is a more holistic approach, and uh, sustainable farming is something which is uh, still at, you know, at the status quo maintaining, so it, it's still good, but the way forward should be looking at the regenerative agriculture aspects. Our standard actually incorporates Many of the principles of regenerative agriculture, such as soil health management, integrated pest management, where there's a lot of focus on biodiversity conservation, agroforestry, and looking at the, you know, in its entirety, the climate smart practices. What are the most pressing challenges facing the tea industry? Ari has been working in the tea industry for a very long time. Uh, What we see currently, specifically in India, in fact, also globally, we see the tea industry is facing significant challenges. Climate change, again, which is directly impacting tea production. They are facing increased pest infestations, which are leading to significant crop loss. You know, you see that there is, in addition to that, supply chain disruptions, which are for the last two years affecting Uh, being affected due to pandemic, there is absenteeism on the farms, there's shortage of labor, increased cost of production. Unfavorable market conditions also are leading to, you know, you know, challenges in their profit scenario. So their profit loss uh, uh, sheets balances are really difficult for them to maintain. And when on top of it, you ask them for sustainable practices. Now, that's a difficult challenge because there's a cost of sustainability which is really difficult to maintain when your entire business is going down because of the prevailing climate and the surrounding environment situations and the uh, operational issues on ground. The key players in the tea industry are already moving towards finding solutions to handle these challenges. They are diversifying and they are looking at moving away from uh, monoculture to see how they can improve their own revenues, whether uh, it is spices. For example, we see a lot of turmeric being grown in those areas in, if, if, if we go back and look at Assam. So those diversifications are happening within the tea industry so that they can also diversify their income sources. So that's a natural progression which we see as happening. Uh, they have already innovated and uh, intensive farming is now moving towards diverse intercropping. I would say the need for shade trees due to the increasing climate conditions then that they feel, is, which is an agroforestry model quite common in the tea industry, 
is also bringing a shift towards diverse and moving away from monoculture practices. And that's really improving the soil health uh, in the long run. Adopting our certification program then brings these regenerative agriculture practices for building resilient farming system in today's world of changing climate. by what you heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of key biz journalists and key experts? Contact them directly through Subtext, a private message-based platform. Avoid the chaos of social media and start a conversation that matters. Subtext message-based platform lets you privately ask meaningful questions of the tea experts, academics, and tea biz journalists reporting from the tea lands. You see their responses via SMS texts, which are sent direct to your phone. Visit our website and subscribe to Subtext to instantly connect with the most connected people in tea. Remember to visit the TBiz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week. Just when you thought the world's most comfortable shoe couldn't get any more comfortable, well, it did. Introducing the Allbirds Woolrunner 2, the next-gen version of the legendary shoe that started it all. It's been refined, redesigned, and completely redefined, with more than a dozen upgrades. It delivers comfy all-day wear that's built for bliss, turning your Cloud 9 into a 10. Plus, they're made with sustainability in mind, so you can feel good with each step you take. Added cushioning that delivers a plush ride? Check. An ultra-cozy merino wool upper for a soft fit and feel? Check. Improved durability that offers lasting wear and comfort? Check, check, and check. Lace up a pair and check off next-level comfort, too. Because when your feet are happy, the rest of you follows. Wherever you're headed, it's easy to keep up the pace when you wear Allbirds. Get yours at Allbirds.com and use code FRESH24 to score a free pair of socks with purchase today. That's a free pair of socks with purchase at ALLBIRDS.com code FRESH24.